So in the previous screencast on citizenship curriculum and mass education, we, we asked the questions that are here on the screen, ranging from what makes people love and die for nations, all the way down to how are globally shared expectations for nation states created? And what does any of this have to do with an imagined community? Now, I know that uh, reading Benedict Anderson's book, Imagined Communities, was not a requirement uh, for this class. And it may be a book that you have or haven't looked at in uh, previous classes in the, the CIE program. But I wanted to explain some of the concepts that come out of imagined communities. And here I'm just showing you, this is what the older cover looks like and the newer cover in case you're looking for a copy of it. And here's Benedict Anderson himself, anthropologist from Cornell University. Uh, I think he's retired by now. <clears throat> And one of the things that I think is really important to consider, especially when we're talking about citizenship and, and or curriculum, is how do we begin by defining a nation? Benedict Anderson says on, right at the beginning of his, uh, of his book that a nation is an imagined political community and imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. Now let's look at the different components of this. One is it's imagined, meaning that most members of the community won't know their fellow members, but they all think they are community nonetheless. And that is true certainly for a nation. It's also true in many ways for people who participate in mass education. It's political, meaning that it relates to the government or the state or matters of authority. Again, Yes, that makes it a nation state, but that also describes most educational systems since they are government sponsored entities. It is a community, which means that regardless of actual inequities, the nation is always conceived as a deep horizontal comradeship. And the way to think of this is that citizens of a particular nation or nation state are not worth more than the other. In other words, there's no, there's no value, there's no American, and in, in, I'm going to use my personal example, who somehow is more American than I am, or less American than I am. You are, we are all part of the American nation, a nation state. And I have a passport just like, you know, somebody else might have a passport. It doesn't make mine better or worse, or theirs better or worse. There's this deep horizontal, meaning that there's not any... Uh, uh, greater or lesser value to it, comradeship. And comradeship simply means that we are, not, not saying we're friends, it's saying that we are colleagues within this nation state, within this imagined community. And again, I think we can make this argument for educational systems and people who are a part of those educational systems, specifically as students, because there is a deep horizontal comradeship that develops among students within the system because we all are sharing similar expectations and experiences as part of the mass education system. Yet there is no real value. There's not one student who's better or worse than another. Although we are certainly evaluated in terms of, of educational and academic performance, and we are graded often by age, um, you know, first grade, second grade, all the way up to 12th grade or, or higher. But that doesn't mean that a first grader is worth more or less than a 12th grader. It simply means that they are at different stages within that uh, community. It's a limited community, meaning that even the largest nations have finite boundaries. There, there is no nation that is coterminous with mankind. You can't say that I, I belong to the nation of humans. Well, I guess you can say that, but it's, it's not very practical and it's certainly not uh, something that would be recognized. The same is true, again, with our participation in mass education. However, and I say this seriously, it is a little more closely uh, aligned with this coterminous co with mankind argument, especially as mass education and opportunity to participate in mass education spreads to uh, every corner of the world. And then finally, sovereign, because legitimacy of the divinely ordained hierarchical dynastic realm has been destroyed. There is no uh, divine king 
um, idea in a nation, right? Not saying that it doesn't exist and that there aren't places where there is a divine king. Um, Saudi Arabia is a great example, and you know I talk about them a lot. <clears throat> However, um, the, the idea of a, a nation state and the way that Anderson is defining it here as an imagined political community does not have a dynastic order to it does not have this dynastic realm uh, with hierarchy and divine ordination for those who are leaders at the top. And again, mass education systems are similar in that way. There's no divinely ordained hierarchical dynastic realm that's associated with a mass education system. Instead, it is an organizational structure that is tended to be administered or led by functional administrators. Hardly divinely oriented, ordained. So what made imagined communities uh, possible at all, according to Benedict Anderson? Well, he argues that it was the dissolution of three ideas historically. The dissolution of the idea of religious communities, that a particular script language offered privileged access to ontological truth, you know, the truth of the, of the heavens and, and of all that is sacred. And that is an important point to make, especially when we're thinking about curriculum and what curriculum provides. There is no special language like Latin, or there is no special language like uh, scholarly Arabic that gains us access to information that others don't have. That, that is not the way that education works anymore either. There's no special script language that is taught in school that offers privileged access to ontological truth. Now, in some post-colonial communities, there is a script language, which is often the language of the colonial power that has now left, right, that is used in school, even though that might not be the indigenous language or the language that students speak in their homes and communities. But that's a little different because still it's not providing privileged access to ontological truth. It might be providing uh, access or improved access and opportunity for learning, but that's slightly different. Benedict Anderson also argues that the dynastic realm idea has dissolved. That's the idea that society was naturally organized around and under these sort of high centers of authority. Meaning that, you know, the, the seat where the king was or the queen was would be the, the high center of a dynastic realm. So in the height of the British Empire's sort of reign, right, London or where the, the king or queen of the British Empire sat, that was the high center. And even though the realm may have spread worldwide, um, it was organized around and everyone sort of traveled back to that high center. We don't have that in the same way with nations now. There may be a capital, um, especially if we're talking about a, a political state. Uh, so there may be a capital where the, the, the national leaders tend to sit or reside, but it is not a high center that people necessarily have to make treks to. And it's not a high center in the, the way that it was before in that it used to be the closer you got to that center, the more you were under the uh, protection and the responsibility of the dynasty. Now think about in terms of education, right? So, uh, you know, I'm sitting here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The Bethlehem area school district is the, is the you know, realm. <laughs> and there is a, uh, a, a school district building that is located in a particular part of Bethlehem. But the closer I get to that building, doesn't mean that I'm more protected and more under the power of the Bethlehem area school district. The school district's power or responsibility extends right up to the boundary of the district. And once you cross over that boundary, it's gone. Right? And so it's, it's an imaginary boundary. We, we made it up. It's not like it's a, a natural chasm that developed because God ordained Bethlehem area school district to cover a certain square acreage. That's not it. So that, that idea of dynastic realm has changed both for the nation state and also for mass education. And then the dissolution of the apprehensions of time. It's the idea that cosmology and history were indistinguishable and that the origins of the world and of men were identical. So that, you know, these ideas that uh, time was really, um, in many ways, unimportant, and that 
you know, the way that the divine developed and the way that the human history developed were intertwined somehow is completely gone. We, we have had a period, at least in the West, called the Enlightenment, which has influenced the ways that we think about our individual humanity and how it's intertwined with, um, with the heavens, with gods, and with, you know, divineness. And uh, we've kind of backed off of that quite a bit, actually. So what, what Benedict Anderson says he's proposing is that nationalism has to be understood by aligning it not with self-consciously held political ideologies, but with the large cultural systems that preceded it, out of which as well as against which it came into being. Now this can be a, a great example for us in terms of both citizenship and curriculum, because it's not the self-consciously held ideologies, it's not what's overtly taught that creates a sense of community and it creates a culture. As much as it is the, uh, um, uh, these, as he puts it, large cultural systems that sort of come into being. These shared expectations, these shared traditions, these shared norms and values that develop around, in, in his case, the nation. In our case, I'm, I'm trying to make the argument that we can extend this to mass education systems. And that it, so again, it's not overtly being taught that you are a schooled person or you're part of this community or nation, but it is by participating in such a large and culturally complex organizational system that has been institutionalized and now is taken for granted that people will participate and are participating. That, that is what creates nationalism or that is what creates the development of a world culture of education. So, <clears throat> Anderson says that all the great classical communities conceived of themselves as cosmically central through the medium of a sacred language linked to a superterrestrial order of power. And accordingly, the stretch of written Latin, Pali, Arabic, or Chinese was in theory unlimited. But in fact, the deader the written language, the farther it was from speech, the better. Because in principle, everyone has access to a pure world of signs. All right, that's a little complex to think about, but again, we're back to this idea of whether or not there is some sort of a privileged way of communicating that does somehow link to uh, celestial or divine origin. And he's saying that, you know, as great classical communities sort of developed, either developed in terms of their nation or in terms of their education, it was, it was sort of around this sacred language idea. But that tends to crumble, and, and historically, Anderson points out how that's crumbled over time. So, for example, the dynastic realm. Its legitimacy derives from divinity, not from populations who, after all, are subjects, not citizens. In the older imagining, where states were defined by centers, borders were porous and indistinct, and sovereignties faded imperceptibly into one another. Hence, paradoxically enough, he says, the ease with which pre-modern empires and kingdoms were able to sustain their rule over immensely heterogeneous and often not even contiguous populations for long periods of time. All right. Now, the, the problem with that was that as we started thinking the nation, the way that we thought about the center and the way that we thought about dynasty shifted. And he says that there are a couple of things that he thinks led to that. One being novels and newspapers, that we had to have some sort of a language that could be uh, spread uh, across large populations, which did away in many cases with the idea of a sacred or a divine language, simply for uh, purposes of practical communication. Another was the introduction of calendrical coincidence, that we began to understand as a as a as large groups, that things happened in a time sequence. And as newspapers and novels became more uh, readily available, we were actually able to track the dates which, with, with which things happened. I don't know if I said that right. <coughs> and then finally, the idea of a mass ceremony, which I want to briefly touch on before I end the screencast. <coughs> the idea that we are all participating in similar activities at similar times and understanding that that happens without us having to be present for it to happen. For example, I know right now in schools across the world, across the world, students are engaging in activities that I'm familiar with. That is in many ways a math ceremony. And we will talk about what that means when we start up with the next screencast.